I'm going to go ahead and pray as we get started. God, thank you so much for your word. We, uh, we would be so lost uh, without the awareness to know all that you require of us, without the clarity that your word produces in us. Your commandment is pure, enlightening the eyes. And so without your commandments, we would be unable to see as clearly as we ought to. And even without your word that has the power in itself um, to change the human heart, uh, without your powerful word that regenerates those who believe, that uh, produces new life, in spiritually dead rebels, uh, we would also not have the ability to seek you, to know you, to do what pleases you, and we would have none of those desires at all. And so how much should we just praise you for speaking uh, so well, so clearly, so powerfully, so sufficiently, free from all error, and you have given us the treasure that we hold in our laps, uh, in our own language, no less. Uh, what a, a great impetus for us to just worship you this morning, to bless you, to praise your name because of your speech. And God, as we turn our attention to your word now, I pray that you would be honored as we honor your word, that the same regard we show to your word, that we would show it to you. Because when your word is exalted, then so are you. And so we pray that you would be pleased with the handling of your word this morning, the articulation of your word, the hearing of your word, the reception of your word by the hearers, and even by my own heart as I, I speak these things, I do pray that it would be in sincerity and that all of our uh, affections would be stirred for you this morning because of the marvelous truth that we get to behold. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John MacArthur, a man who has been faithful in ministry more than 52 years and who has shaped an entire generation of biblical expositors, in his short book on sanctification, he bewails that holiness has taken a back seat in so many churches. Listen to his description in that book of the shift that has taken place in his lifetime away from an emphasis on growing in Christ likeness, on sanctification. He says this, why is this emphasis missing in contemporary evangelical churches? I grew up hearing sermons regularly about the need for holiness, godliness, Christ-likeness, separation from sin and from the world, and its values. In previous generations, if a preacher neglected the theme of holiness it would have stood out as a major and deeply troubling omission. Calls to godly obedience had a much higher place in the message that came from the pulpit, in the thinking of the people in the pews, and in the life of the church as a whole. Sanctification was a major emphasis in every confessionally Protestant and biblically oriented denomination, and preachers boldly proclaim the need for sanctification right alongside the doctrine of justification by faith. Historic Protestants understood that the main work of the Holy Spirit was not to produce bizarre, inexplicable, esoteric, out-of-body phenomena. The real work of the Holy Spirit was seen in manifest holiness, Christ-like virtue, no one ever imagined any conflict between the dual truths that believers are saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief 
in the truth, citing 2 Thessalonians 2.13. None of that is true anymore. The truth of sanctification, together with words like holiness, godliness, and Christ-likeness, are all but gone from popular Christian discourse. Rarely do you hear any popular preachers urge their people to be separate from the world, to deny fleshly desires, or to mortify sin and selfishness. Instead, following the popular strategies of pragmatism and seeker sensitivity, all the longings of the selfish human heart are being legitimized. The fads and entertainments of the world, along with some of the twisted moral values of the sexual revolution, are being incorporated into churches because pastors have been told these are necessary elements to attract people who otherwise have no interest in God. Inexplicably, even many pastors and church leaders who profess to believe that God is sovereign and the gospel and the power of God for, is the power of God for salvation have embraced that blatantly pragmatic philosophy. They will say they believe the doctrine of justification by faith, and they don't mind preaching about it from time to time because they can do it in a way that won't intrude on an unbeliever's comfort zone. They might even occasionally, occasionally bring up the subject of glorification, but practically nothing is said about sanctification. In fact, preaching designed to make people feel good Preaching is designed to make people feel good about the way they are and to assure them that God likes them that way. This is a new version of Christianity. It seems to me that John MacArthur is right, not only about the lack of preaching on sanctification in our day, but also about the fact that this is, in fact, a new version of Christianity. Since the creation of man on day six, holiness, being like God, has been God's priority for man. Obedience, holiness, Christ-likeness, uprightness, righteousness, all of those being synonymous terms, sanctification, practical righteousness, that is the priority for the Christian. And this is actually quite easy to demonstrate from Scripture. So that is what I want to do this morning. I want to demonstrate with just two passages, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, that holiness is God's priority. This will sort of be two sermons in one session. So this week, we'll look at two passages that just demonstrate beyond the shadow of a doubt that Christ-likeness, a Christ-like life, true holiness, is in fact the priority of the Christian life. That was the belief of Old Testament saints as well as New Testament writers. And then because there's just plenty to be said on this subject. Next week, I want to just look in rapid succession at many convincing proofs that holiness is the priority of the Christian life. We'll aim this week to dig down a little bit deeper into two passages, and then we'll take sort of a shotgun approach next week and just look at all the reasons, uh, a dozen or more proofs why holiness is the goal of the Christian life and not something else. That may even, hearing that may sound strange to you. How would you describe in your own words what is the goal of the Christian life? What's the priority? What should be the overwhelming consuming distraction of the Christian, of the mind of the Christian, of the life of the Christian? What should we all as believers be obsessed with, unapologetically so? 
I would argue that it is this matter of holiness. And that's not hard to understand if you have what is a biblical definition of holiness. If you hear the word holiness and you think conformity to a set of rules, and you are repulsed by the thought that that should be the overwhelming thrust and priority of the Christian life, well, that's a a right recoil because that's not what true holiness is. It is not external conformity to a set of rules. Holiness is not fitting in with the people who call themselves the people of God. It's not uh, following the way of your Christian friends. It's not getting on board with whatever the the church is teaching and whatever the members of that church are practicing. That's not holiness. A biblical definition of holiness ought to make it easy for every Christian to go, oh yeah, of course that's the, the, the priority of the Christian life. And I'll just remind you what we saw last week, how we defined sanctification. This is my own attempt at a a working definition, at least. Sanctification is that God wrought comprehensive but gradual conformity to Christ's likeness, which follows conversion and originates in the heart of the child of God as the child of God actively submits his will to God by faith for the glory of God. That's a mouthful. But that is what sanctification is. It is the God-wrought, comprehensive, but gradual conformity to Christ's likeness, which follows conversion and originates in the heart as the child of God actively submits his will to God by faith for the glory of God. So inherent in a biblical definition of sanctification of true holiness is a focus on the inner life. It is something that is produced by God. It's gradual. It involves believing the truth, faith, as we'll see in subsequent lessons, and we'll we'll talk about that in subsequent equipping hours. But if that is what holiness is, then of course this is the predominating occupation of the Christian life. And we're going to see that fact in two brief passages this morning. Turn first to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. These are the last two verses of that incredible book in your Bible. And this passage, in Solomon's own words, is going to demonstrate that sanctification is the priority of the Christian life. It is the priority of the Christian life because this is the priority that God has laid on all men, is to be in as much as is possible like God. God to be obedient. Ecclesiastes 12, starting at verse 13, and I'm going to be utilizing just a a couple different translations, uh, moving back and forth between the English Standard Version and the New American Standard Bible. There are nuances that are helpful in both translations. The ESV translates that, those verses. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And again, 
the New American Standard Bible, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. In his own words, in a a way that is unique to this biblical writer and no other biblical writer, Solomon proves the point that genuine holiness, genuine obedience to God is the overwhelming preoccupation of all men. Here's how I'm summarizing this passage. If you're taking notes, here's a summary. Man's one duty in this life is God-fearing obedience. Man's one duty in this life is God-fearing obedience. Seven characteristics of Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14 demonstrate the, the truth of this claim. Seven characteristics of Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14 demonstrate the truth of this claim. The first characteristic that proves from this passage that man's one duty in this life is God-fearing obedience is the very location of the passage itself. The location of this passage proves this point, man's one duty in this life is God-fearing obedience. Solomon has spent many, many, many words in this book describing the vanity of this life. He has taken us on something of a tour of all of the various pleasures and good gifts that God gives under the sun and what man might do with them if he had all wealth at his disposal, all opportunity at his disposal, how man might embark upon a pursuit of those things under the sun to his own pleasure. And Solomon has really left nothing out. He's not left us wanting in this tour. As the tour guide, the preacher identified in Ecclesiastes Solomon has done a thorough job so that when he pulls back into the station in Ecclesiastes 12 at the end of the book, there is nothing wanting about what else there is left to do under the sun. And he has called it all vanity. There is no thing left in this life to wonder If it can ultimately satisfy, the answer is no, it cannot. Solomon proves the point. He's tried it. He's lived that life. You will not have the resources that Solomon had to go after this. So based on his experience as a man, you should take his word. But even more so, after pinning these God-breathed words, you can take him at his word. This is God's trustworthy note to us. All things under the sun are vanity. He has made them such. They will not yield the satisfaction that man desires. After so many words, this is the only thing left to say. So whatever is said here, you can trust. And this is included as the very last word of this book. This is the punctuation on the entire letter, the entire sermon preached by Solomon near the end of his life. And so when he tells us what the purpose of life is, it is after everything has been considered and as the final thing that needs to be considered. 
And the way he summarizes this one duty is God-fearing obedience. The location of this passage demonstrates the truth of this claim. The finality, secondly, of this passage demonstrates the truth of this claim. Where this passage is located, as well as the finality, which he says in the very words themselves, this is the end of the matter. All has been heard. There's nothing else left to consider. So the location, as well as the finality of what is being said, proves the point. This is the duty, of, the single duty of man, God-fearing obedience. Even thirdly, the order that this passage is laid out, just the order of the words themselves prove this point. This is not as apparent in your English Bibles, perhaps. The way he summarizes the end of the matter, this this duty, fear God and keep his commandments is how it's translated. And it's a good translation. It wouldn't be good English otherwise. But there's an order happening here in the original text where God and commandments are the leading words, not the commands themselves, fear and keep. So to the Hebrew listener, to the Hebrew reader, front-loaded for their ears, for their eyes, are the words, God, commandments, that's the purpose of life. God, commandments. And just notice the order, again, not only of that God and commandments are are front-loaded, but also the commands themselves. Fear, keep, or fear, obey. That's the, that's the right order. It's almost as if Solomon is telling us one thing precedes the other in order. A fear of God precedes or becomes the foundation for true obedience. Fearing God must precede obeying God. As one author says, conduct derives from worship. A knowledge of God leads to obedience, not vice versa. A knowledge of God leads to obedience, not vice versa. One cannot exist without the other, but one must precede the other. Before you obey God, in sincerity, you must fear God in sincerity. At the heart level, before God, you must revere him, regard him as great, awesome, worthy of all reverence and worship and ascribed worth that you could possibly muster. The person who seeks, attempts to obey God without that view of God, will fail every single time. And I would recommend John Anderson's uh, sermon on the fear of God a number of months ago, uh, where he took several equipping hour sessions to describe what is the fear of God. It always goes hands, hand in hand with obedience. So this is God-fearing obedience. God-fearing obedience. It is obedience that proceeds from a genuine fear of the Lord, a true knowledge of God, a love of God. These things have always gone hand in hand. Just turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. When Moses sent the children of Israel, that second generation, into the promised land to take over Canaan, being prohibited from going himself, he sent them with this echoing in their ears. 
fear and obedience. Look at verse 1 in Deuteronomy 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which Yahweh your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. That's a lot of things to do. Commandments, statutes, judgments. These things are being taught. They must be learned by the hearer and then practiced that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. And God gave them a law perfectly suited to be practiced in the land that couldn't be accurately or thoroughly obeyed outside of the land even. He gave them sufficient instructions. Verse 2 says, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear Yahweh, your God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. They were taught these things by Moses so that they might fear God and obey God. That is the purpose of the law. And so those things, fear God, fearing God and obeying God, fear and obedience go hand in hand. This is God-fearing obedience. The fourth characteristic of Ecclesiastes 12 that proves, that demonstrates the truth that this one duty of man in this life is God-fearing obedience is the simplicity of the passage. Just in very few words, he gives us, he just summarizes what all of life is about. I mean, how many times have philosophers attempted that and just written tome after tome? The self-help gurus try to describe unsuccessfully what the purpose of life is. Here, Solomon does it just in a few words. Fear God, keep his commandments. It's almost as if the simplicity of this passage reflects the simplicity of the one duty we have in life. It's not complicated. It's not confusing. Doesn't require great intellect, superior intelligence to grasp this. A child can understand this. You teach your children these things. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Why, Dad? Because this is right. Simple answer for simple minds like us. The purpose of life is not confusing. Why we exist is not difficult to understand. And so the simplicity of this passage demonstrates that. You have two commands. Fear God. Keep his commandments. They're imperatives, commands for us to obey. The fifth element, the fifth characteristic of this passage that proves that God-fearing obedience is the purpose of life is seen in the singularity, the singularity that arises from this passage. Notice, whatever, uh, if you're reading the ESV especially, the way it's phrased here, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. That's helpful because the singularity or the singleness, the, the one thing is kind of summarized with that word duty. Notice he does not say for these, 
plural, are the duties, plural, of man. Because that's not actually what he's saying. How many commands does he give? Two, right? Two commands, fear God, keep his commandments. You would think he would say, because these two things are the whole duty of man, are the, the duties of man. It's not the duties of man. Those two imperatives are parts of the one duty that we have in this life. They're not technically two separate things to go do. It's, it's like someone telling their, their child, go upstairs and clean your room. Man, that's a lot to do, mom. You're not giving two separate things. Go upstairs and clean the room. Well, you are, but you're not. Your intention is one single thing. Love your wife and prioritize date night. Man, that's a lot to do. No, it's not. (laughs) The intention is to prioritize date nights as a manifestation of love for your wife. That's the point here. Fear God and keep his commandments is not two separate things, technically. The goal is this one duty of God-fearing obedience, and the obedience is the manifestation of the fear of God. This is one duty, one thing to go do. So God has, in that sense, made it simple by making it singular. It is this, this is what we are given to do, God-fearing obedience. Another characteristic, the sixth characteristic that makes the point is the impartiality, the impartiality that arises from this passage. Notice the impartiality that is on display at the end of verse 13. This applies to Every person, no one's left out. This applies to every person, impartial, old and young, male and female, adult and child, rich, poor, whatever the situation is in life, wherever you find yourself, at all seasons, this applies. It is, there is an impartiality toward people. There is also an impartiality that arises in verse 14 toward deeds. For God will bring every act, every deed. So every person is in view, every deed is in view. And even toward the secret things, the hidden things, there is an impartiality. Everything which is hidden or every secret thing, impartial, whether it's overt or covert, it it is seen, it is judged. Whether it's uh, an external deed or an inward thought, every act is judged. Whether it's a... good deed carried out and practiced over a long period of time or just a momentary motivation, everything gets seen by the omniscient God who created man and is brought into judgment. He is impartial toward all men in that way. People who do not fear God do not want this God who is just in this way. He is impartial in that sense. The seventh and final characteristic that proves the point is just the logic of the verse. He, he gives a, an explanation in verse 14 for why this ought to be done, fearing God, keeping his commandments. 
for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. That's Solomon's logic. That's why it's reasonable to embrace the fear of God, God-fearing obedience as the one duty of man. Because every deed of every person gets called to account. That is the motivation he gives us for why to embrace these words. One author commenting on this section says, Solomon's pursuit of wisdom and investigation of mankind's condition under the sun results in an incitement to true piety. Solomon's pursuit of wisdom and investigation of mankind's condition under the sun results in what we read here, an incitement to true piety. This passage, understanding that this is your one duty in life from God, your creator, is intended to produce God-fearing obedience, true piety, holiness of life, that manifests itself externally but begins in the heart. Christian, how are you doing at carrying out the purpose for which you exist? Are you practicing God-fearing obedience? Are you practicing God-fearing obedience at the level of your motivations? Do you, do you fight hard to fear God and obey him at the level of your motivations? How about the level of your desires where no one else can see when you, when you, unless you share that with them? Are you fighting to obey God with your desires because you fear him? What about your thought life? Those are secret things. No one knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit that's in him. That, that can be a comforting statement. If you work hard for obedience there, if God is purifying that part of, of your life, that is not an encouragement to turn sin over at the level of our thoughts, are you working hard to practice God-fearing obedience there? That is why you exist. That is why I exist. No genuine holiness can take place unless God-fearing obedience is practiced at the level of secrecy in your life. Only when that is happening can you fairly describe what's happening in your life, what, what you're practicing as sanctification. When God-fearing obedience in the secret places produces God-fearing obedience externally, conformity to Christ's likeness, being like God, then you can fairly call what's happening in your life what God is doing in you, sanctification. That's our Old Testament. You know, much has been made about Christ finally having come. You know, Solomon was looking forward to the Messiah, to his own descendant, who is the Lord himself, who would reign one day on his throne in Jerusalem and so Solomon acknowledges that God, as creator, has laid this duty upon all men. Did something change when Christ finally came, when that hope was fulfilled? Is there something about the fulfillment of the incarnation, of Christ finally having come, made the gospel 
actual, made the gospel history instead of hoped for. You know, he, he made the gospel, he took it out of the category of eschatology, something that would happen in the latter days, and fulfilled it in human history so that it's past tense now. Does that somehow change what is our singular duty and pursuit in life? The Apostle Paul did not think so. Go to Colossians chapter 1. The same comprehensive duty of man that Solomon articulated in Ecclesiastes 12, Paul adopts as his singular aim in ministry. You would think if there were a time in history to undo some wrong thinking about this obsession with obedience, this was the time to do it. The foundation of the church in the apostles and New Testament prophets, they're here, first century still, receiving new revelation. You know, if God's people could be too consumed with obedience, real obedience that stemmed from a fear of God, this would be a great time, Paul, to just tell us that our focus, our weight has been in the wrong place. He does not do that. Look at verses 28 and 29 in Colossians chapter 1. Paul says, we proclaim Christ. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose, sounds like Solomon, singularity there. This purpose, I also labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Colossians 1, 28 to 29 offer a formula for properly proclaiming Christ. A formula for properly proclaiming Christ includes three elements. We'll look at that with the remaining time that we have. A formula for properly proclaiming Christ includes three elements. Here's why this passage is so helpful for us, 21st century Christians, um, at this particular moment in history, where there has uh, really confusion abounds in our day as books about sanctification and how Christians change fly off the shelves, this passage is so helpful because people are confused about what's the right balance between law and gospel as it's often pitched. You know, how much... Where does the gospel fit in ministry? Uh, where does the gospel fit in counseling? My articulation of the details of penal substitutionary atonement, Christ receiving the judgment for sinners who believe in their place, rescuing them from the wrath of God and doing that right before resurrecting. Where, do, where does that message need to fit? fit, and how do I balance that out with all of the things that God has told us to do, the indicatives versus the imperatives of the gospel as it's framed, the indicatives, things that are true of all Christians, things like your identity in Christ, justification by faith, adoption, redemption, forgiveness of sins, things that are accomplished by grace alone and just true of Christians, where do the indicatives fit and get, how do they get balanced with the imperatives, the commands that God has given to his New Testament church? Paul is clearly not confused 
and doesn't even seem to have to fight for a balance. They both go together. It's almost like we're trying to find out how to reconcile two things that are already friends. You don't have to reconcile friends, as it's been said. Proclaiming Christ, admonishing and teaching every man for the sake of completion in Christ, for the sake of being able to present people in Christ mature, are not at odds. The imperatives and the indicatives, if accurately taught with all biblical wisdom, don't have to be reconciled or balanced. When all wisdom is applied, the proper balance, if you will, is what is communicated. Proper balance is struck. Here are the three elements for this formula that Paul lays out for us in properly proclaiming Christ. The three elements are this, the right methods, the right motivation, and the right means. The right methods, motivation, and means in ministry are a formula to properly proclaiming Christ. I'm sorry, you know, if a formula sounded like you were going to get a a step-by-step first this, it doesn't work that way. Paul says, with all wisdom, (laughs) there's your catch-all category for how do I do this? Well, apply all wisdom, and there you go. The first element in this formula is the right methods. Notice that he is saying we proclaim him, and then he says how he does that. Admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. How do you proclaim Christ? You admonish every man and you teach every man with all wisdom. No one gets left out. Impartiality again In this passage as well, every man, every man, and then again, every man, three times in verse 28, every man is in view. These twin methods here include warning and teaching. Warning, it is... Uh, instruction that seeks to prevent wrong behavior, to caution people, don't go that way, stop going that way, cease these practices, behaviors, thought patterns, etc. That's the warning, that's the admonishing idea. So for the good of the every man, the all men, stop this and change course. The teaching is a synonymous term, closely related. It is positively instilling or instructing someone in the right way to go. And Paul did both. Paul did both. He could warn when it was appropriate, and he could encourage and impart information into the mind of the hearer when it was, when it was appropriate. Uh, he could bring a, a, a stern warning and a gentle encouragement. He could bring a reminder of who you are in Christ at the right time for the right person. And he could give a command, lay the burden of a command of something to do on the right person at the right time. How did he know when and who to apply what to? Well, he did it with all wisdom. It takes biblical discernment to know who's sitting in front of me, needing to be instructed, needing to be warned. What do they need in this moment? Are they suffering from sin done against them? They don't need a warning. They don't need a, an admonition. 
They may need to be encouraged and prevented from being uh, faint-hearted. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 gives us those categories. Admonish the unruly. Is this person just refusing to get in line to, with God's instruction to bring himself in line under God's authority? He needs to be admonished. He needs to be warned. He needs to be rebuked. But is the person just faint-hearted, ready to give up? They need to be strengthened. They need to be encouraged, have courage put into them. Is this person just weak? <laughs> Perhaps there's a, a weakness of understanding. What does that person need? He needs help. Come alongside. Teach him a better way. And maybe you find the same person vacillating between all three of those categories, and so you move between admonition, encouragement, and help. In 1 Thessalonians 5.14, what do you do? Be patient with them all, regardless of who you're dealing with. That requires biblical wisdom. You've got to have as much as you possibly can the entirety of the scriptures at your disposal, in your mind, ready to draw on from your own remembrance. You've got to know what's in Philemon. You've got to know what's in Joel and Hosea and Leviticus. You might need it. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So our ability to admonish and teach is only as good as our knowledge of Scripture so that we can bring all wisdom to bear on a particular situation, on a particular person, on every man. The second element of this formula for properly proclaiming Christ, how is Christ properly proclaimed? Well, with the right motivation. The right motivation so that we may present every man complete in Christ. That is his motivation. That is the goal of Paul's ministry, to present every man complete in Christ. And he says we, the presenting element involved in, in this uh, leads me to think that it's more so the role of a teacher primarily, right? The one who has oversight over God's household as an under-shepherd, as a teacher, as a leader in the church. Certainly this would apply uh, first and foremost to those people. Paul introduced the letter to the Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. And then he mentions Epaphras, who brought the gospel to the Colossians in verse 7 just as you learned it from Epaphras, the gospel, the grace of God and truth. And so the teacher in God's church being responsible to mature the body through the ministry of the word, I think this primarily that we applies there. Paul, the apostles, Timothy, Epaphras, people like them. This was the motivation of the Apostle Paul. Here the minister's accountability is in view because he says we, I think that again, that we is partic has particular reference to ministers of the word. We present. That's the, the duty of the gospel minister. Uh, the possibility, at least the possibility of loss is also in view because he says that we may or that we might, the idea is something that could or could not happen, right? We could present you not complete in Christ. So Paul's aware not only of his own accountability, but also the possibility of, of loss in this category of failure to present people complete or mature or holy. The goal of maturity, though, is also in view. 
every man complete. Every man complete. Complete is the idea of maturity in Christ likeness. That you would look like Christ that when you stand before God, I can say, ah, Jesus, look at him. They look like you. Is that for you, Christian, the, the preoccupation of your life like it was for Paul in his ministry? He has the methods, the right methods that he has for this one goal, presenting people complete in Christ. That's it. Do you think of your life like that? When you come on Sundays, equipping hour, main service, evening service, small group, build, wellspring, trust, etc. Do you go with the mindset, I need to be further completed in Christ, further matured by sitting under this next hour, hour, 10, you know, sermon. That should be the attitude. The realm of sanctification is also in view. It's Christ himself in Christ that we may present every man complete in Christ. And then finally, the right means. The right means. In short, the right means involve relentless labor, submissive labor, and dependent labor. That's what Paul says. For this purpose also I labor striving according to his power which mightily works in me. He is describing relentless labor because he says he does it striving, but according to his power. Paul got on the same page with Christ. How Christ was working is how Paul wanted to work. Not doing his own thing. Hey, Jesus, I have some good ideas for how to grow your church too. No. Jesus, what would you love to do in your church? I'm going to bring myself in accordance with that standard and work in that way. This is submissive labor. But he does it not only relentlessly and submissively, but dependently, which he mightily works in me. The idea that is that Christ is the one working this power, his own power in Paul, and so Paul recognizes his dependence. Proclaiming Christ, to summarize this passage, proclaiming Christ means communicating truth that will allow the minister to present those under his care to God as mature saints because he labored tirelessly in submission to Christ by Christ's power at work in him. And in addition to what we saw this morning, there are many, many, many more reasons to esteem sanctification as the priority of the Christian life. We'll rattle those off next week in equipping hour. God, thank you for the reminder from both Old and New Testaments that this is your desire for us. We could not come up with a better plan. And regardless of what others might say about the priority of life, regardless of how others might recoil at our insistence that Christ's likeness to be conformed to your image, the one who is your image, is our one duty. Let us be unashamed, God, of what you have said because you have convinced us that this is the only way. I pray that for those hearing my words. I pray that for Grace Bible Church, even those who aren't here, that we would gain clarity increasingly so that you would make us a holy people who accurately represent your name and uphold your truth in a perverse and wicked generation. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.